Professor Stewart, thank you very much for accepting to do an interview. Nice, no, all right. With uh, nice to us. be in a park as well. Indeed, yes. So you are here in Geneva, mm. the invitation of the University of Geneva to give a talk about uh, disaster and about how to communicate with communities about yeah. that. Um, we are excited to have you here also as a science communicator. Yeah. So we'd like to ask you, how come someone <laughs> like you, um, let's say, who's so outgoing and so unlike what we would call a typical academic, academic yeah, has I don't become know. an academic? I don't know. I think I had a midlife crisis somewhere down the line. I mean, I think, so a lot of academics are incredibly passionate about what they do. I mean, they kind of show that in front of, you know, a few hundred students. But, but I remember thinking, why, why is my subject, which is geology, the earth, why is it not on television? Why is it not reaching millions? And so I was, fa I was fascinated by why not. So I, in the end, I gave my job up, actually, as a lecturer. And then I, um, for one year, went unemployed and I went around all the television companies, knocking on the door, saying, Kind of make programs about geology and they were funny they started talking to me about like archaeology and i said no 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 you know geology and they said well, what's what's geology and i explained and they said stones you want to make a program on stones you know and what was thinking was i never thought of stones to me the it was the planet it was how it worked it was all that passion i had in teaching and so it was trying to convey that on the screen. So you actually sat down and said, I'd li really like to see my subject on TV. Yeah, can I'm going to go and see if yeah. anyone wants it. Because there was nothing there. And I kind of figured that the first person in had a real chance at it. You know, the second and third and fourth, it was harder and harder. So even if you were only half good, you would have a good opportunity. So I understood how geology worked. I understood how academia worked. I didn't understand how the media worked. I didn't understand how the public thought about things. And so by the first, my series producer, when, so we got it commissioned, the series producer had a meeting with me and she said, don't be too sad, but I think this is really boring. And I was like, <laughs> and she said, well, every, every episode, it's earthquakes and volcanoes and people are dying. And she said, it should be more about what people are interested in. So ordinary people, you know, what they're interested in is playing football or something like that. But what are people interested in? Mm -hmm. Make geology about what people are interested in. So food, art, architecture, all these kind of things. So, so what are the major takeaways from your, uh, this first crash course well, I in think media the, training? I think the importance of the audience. I think the importance of who you're talking to. So we always say the important thing is the message, get the message right. But actually I think you can't get the message right unless you know who you're in front of you, so that's one. I think making it relevant to people, make it ah. to music, you know, the geology of music or something like that. Exactly, we that's can a listen thing. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. We should have had the magic flute because that's an opera about geology. But, oh really? Yeah, I didn't know that. No, no. I will pretend I'm very knowledgeable about music and tell you this is a piece from Stravinsky. It's Stravinsky, is it? No, I'm, I don't know music very well. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> this expert knowledge approachable? I think it's this empathy. I think the, the problem academics have is we're taught to be the experts. So when you go through a degree, PhD, years of experience and you build up this technical expertise. So it's not that surprising that when they then face with the public, they feel the need is to give that technical expertise. But actually, if people are to um, kind of make changes to the lives that are difficult with the climate change or disasters, they need to want to make those changes. So they need to trust you. And so how can they trust this person who appears out of nowhere, is this very clever person who's got all this technical knowledge and says, this is what you should do. And so I think that it's about 
dialogue, it's about conversations with people to try to make those connections, to, to try and build that trust. And do you feel that from when you started, things have changed for academics who want to go towards the public? I, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's changed a lot. I think that in the academic world, there's a need, a, a recognition, a need to get the message out. It's from funders, it's from the universities themselves that are selling the science, you know, to, they're saying, come to our university, we're amazing. I think that scientists themselves, for example, in the disaster world, are realizing that the technical science is only carrying us so far. They see the same mistakes, the same disasters repeating. And so they're more aware and willing to work with social scientists and anthropologists and psychologists, etc. And then, of course, technology. I mean, we've got amazing technology now that, can, that people can communicate in an instant, you know, with social media or, or uh, the easy things of producing YouTube and things like that. So I think the whole thing's changed. I think the problem maybe is there's too much opportunity now because academics are still being told to be academics, but then to communicate to the public and to do all of this. So it's tough on young early career researchers, I think, now to be doing everything. So if there were some two or three pieces of advice in terms of how to frame their message or how to deal with audience, what would that be for young? Um, I think it's about thinking about good stories, converting, converting their work, their, their facts, their information into compelling narratives. It's about finding the human in it, you know, the human the emotional connection uh, to, their, to their work. And it's letting their passion show, you know, the passion that got them into the subject in the first place and then was beaten out of it by practical after practical <laughs> after practical. Finding that again and conveying that to someone because if you're not going to be interested in something and convey it, why should someone else? I think for one conclusive question for me actually as a uh, personal interest is um, I know that your position at Plymouth University is also of a UNESCO chair. So yeah. That makes me think of connections with the international policy world, with yeah. agencies. Um, how does one get to that? Does being a science communicator help you open doors? Or it's yeah. more the impact of what you've done that has brought institutions to you? I, I think it's a little bit more the second one. So I when I was interested in communicating, and originally it was to the public, I didn't think much of policy and politicians, I thought that's a different area. But I think politicians learn or need communicate, to be communicated to in much the same way. They need stories, they need it to be impactful, they need to make it care for them. So I started to get a bit more confident in the last few years about trying to get into that policy area, because it's where it matters. I mean, the big decisions are about governance. Um, and so I think it was a mixture of a little bit of both I knew I needed to move into that space. UNESCO was really well placed with its cultural scientific education. And so it was a, it was a, a, a sensible marriage, really. Yeah. And uh, what do you see the next frontier in science communication then to be? I think that's hard. I think what's interesting in science communication is getting told to go in two different directions. So one is be more people-centered, dialogic, involving people um, in communities, etc. At the same time, big data, social media, which, uh, you know, the, the internet, internet, which is removed from people. So I, I don't quite understand how we can be both people and community centered and also ex use big data and social media. So I think fusing those two, because, you know, we all know that people use their phones all the time, there's ways to do it but I'm not sure it's going to be conventional media that does it. It's more going to be the you know, smaller scale things where you're actually working with people that's probably going to be more effective actually, rather than big blue chip multinational kind of channel in big series. So your next production is going to be a small It's going to be this size. I like the idea of this size. This is kind of a nice small setup rather than, you know, a big multi-million pound one. <laughs> well, we look forward maybe to working with you next. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> and thank you very much. You've been very generous to grant no, no, no. us this time on a very busy day. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. thanks a lot. Thanks for giving me this walk in the park and the music as well.